Good morning. Glad to be here with y'all. Um, I'm sure Dan is having a good time in Israel. So, um, for the next two weeks, we're going to be covering, I can guarantee you, the most exciting topic in the world, in the universe. Revelation 19, we're going to look at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Today, we're going to look at verses 1 through 10, and then next week, we'll finish out the chapter. This is the Word of God. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because His judgments are true and righteous, for He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and He has avenged the blood of His bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you His bondservants, you who fear Him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. It was given her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are true words of God. Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Let's pray. Whenever I officiate a wedding, I tell the congregation that the picture of wedding before you, the marriage, is in reality a picture of the gospel very clear in Ephesians 5 uh, that Christ plays the role of the husband and the church is to play well the role of the wife. He'll even say, as he lines out marriage by inspiration of the Spirit, Paul says in Ephesians 5.32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. You thought you were seeing a wedding take place. Well, you are, but in reality, it's just a picture of the gospel Two becoming one, and that's what Christ and the church have done. In the West, uh, the bride is always the focus of our weddings, and yet, and rightfully so, but in the courts of heaven, when God brings it all down to the earth, we're going to find out actually the groom is the focus, because the groom is God, Jesus Christ. Uh, When Dr. Johnson spoke on this years ago, he told a story, and I figured it was safe to tell since he told it. He says, there is a story about a Roman Catholic archbishop by the name of Ryan. The archbishop was attending confirmation in a small parish. The local priest was asking questions that the young student was supposed to know, yet she was very frightened. And the priest asked her to define the state of matrimony. And she replied, it's a state of terrible torment, which those who enter are compelled to undergo for a time to prepare them for a better world. No, no, shouted the rector. That's not matrimony. That's the definition of purgatory. Whereupon the archbishop said, leave her alone. Perhaps the child has been shown the light. Which is crazy. And yet, sadly, this is the case for many couples in this fallen world. It's difficult. Paul says, let me save you some trouble. Don't get married, he says in 1 Corinthians. And yet, at the same time, we also see Proverbs 18, 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. I know I have. So what we're going to see today is the marriage uh, taking place. And we're going to see the second coming of Christ. I think you'll be surprised, if you've never thought about this before, how many illusions there are Uh, not only in this passage, but in the ministry of Jesus, of a groom and a bride. It's meant to be this way, and it always has been this way in the mind of God. 
So, for the next two weeks, we'll be looking at three topics. First one uh, is verses 1 through 6. There will be a lot of rejoicing over the the coming kingdom. Uh, Secondly, in verses 7 through 10, it's the invitation to enter the kingdom and the wedding feast. And then next week, we'll actually see verses 11 through 21, the coming of Christ and His kingdom to the earth. So, let's go ahead and dive into the text And we got Revelation 19, verses 1 and 2. After these things, I heard something like a loud voice and a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God, because His judgments are true and righteous. For He has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and He has avenged the blood of His bondservants on her. Now, throughout Revelation, you're going to see a compilation of even some Old Testament books, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Psalms, Deuteronomy. And there's a lot of Old Testament passages that are kind of being brought into their proper fruition, into the very end here. Um, What we see, it says, after these things, uh, the great tribulation has just passed in Revelation chapter 18. And so it's all kind of come to a conclusion And then he'll say, I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude. And who is this, by the way? Is this angelic or is this human? And I get the idea it's the saints who are crying out here in joy. And they're crying out hallelujah, a term that we've used oftentimes, and yet many people don't know exactly what it means. It's actually a transliteration from Hebrew, and it's made up of two words. Number one is hallelujah, which is actually written in the imperative, and it means in the Hebrew to give praise. Uh, And then at the back side, you've got yah. Yah is a shortened word of Yahweh. Uh, So when you put them both together, uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's first seen actually in Psalm 104, verse 35, where it's a praise directed towards God for the destruction of the wicked. We are so thankful that you will destroy the wicked one day. This is is the idea. He'll say, let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. And yet what is fascinating is in the Psalms, it's always said, praise the Lord. But in Revelation, it's always uh, quoted as hallelujah. It's never translated. Why? I don't know. And if you can find out, let let me know. We'll let you preach here next Sunday. Um, It says here, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Uh, Salvation here is not justification, probably. Here it seems to be referring to the deliverance of evil from the world is what God is about to bring. And notice it says, he's judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality. The great harlot. What is that? Well, you'd have to read uh, Revelation 17 and 18 to get the context of it. She's called Babylon. Um, At Babylon, it's basically all in the world that draws you away from the worship of the one true God. From even from the time of Eden, we were drawn away by our own uh, choices. And then in Babel, in Genesis 11, and that's where the term comes from, we decided to make a name for ourselves. And so it it comprises all false religion, uh, the state of wicked man in its politics, in its entertainment. Uh, Dr. Johnson had said, all that seeks to frustrate the purpose of the creation. What was the creation made for? To glorify God, right? And what does Babylon, this this sense of evil that all of us have within us, seek to do to, to suppress it? Uh, Say, no, you're not going to glorify God. You will will enjoy life. You will have it your way. So Babylon here we find out is guilty of two evils. Number one, she corrupts the earth with her immorality. And number two, she kills the servants of God. Dan Duncan has said, The kingdom of God cannot exist with the kingdom of the beast that's presently on the earth. Life, uh, light and darkness cannot mix. So this system, this city must be destroyed and its corrupting influence removed from the earth. And so what is God going to do? God is going to, to uh, have revenge. Why? Because the, she has killed his bondservants. People, uh, if you were to ask somebody on the street, is revenge bad? Is revenge a sin? Um, how would you answer that? 
you would probably, you, as a believer, you should know your theology and say, well, it depends. Who's committing it? If it's man committing it, it's always wrong. Always. And yet, if God is committing revenge, it's always good and it is always righteous. You see, the reason why we can't commit revenge is we don't know the hearts of men. We don't understand motivation. Uh, we are sinful. But God can judge man rightly and perfectly as he commits revenge. And it's true justice, really. Verse 3 and 4. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 creatures and the four living, rather, 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sits on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. First off, in three, verse 3, it says, Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And, the, and this concept is that God's judgment is irreversible. It will not change. It cannot change because God has so made it that way. There is no annihilationism in hell. Their smoke rises up forever and ever. That's how horrible it will be. He says here also it says these 24 elders and four living creatures fall down. What is that about? Well, 24 elders, you'd have to go back to Revelation 4 and 5 to see them. They're seated on, thro on thrones with crowns that would give this indication that they are kings, now reigning as kings. They're clothed in white, and we would take that as Christ's righteousness. And notice they're elders. We have seven elders here. What do the elders do? Many things. <laughs> Many things. We're so thankful for them and for the shepherding they do, but yet they also represent groups of people. And in particular, the seven elders do represent us um, in ways that uh, for governing purposes. And shepherding. And so these elders are representative of redeemed believers of all time. Uh, that's what I believe. That's what many believe. And you see here, why 24? Well, there's 12 tribes of the Old Testament, 12 apostles of the New Testament. I get the idea it's the redeemed of all time here. Uh, we see also the four living creatures. Uh, most seem to believe that these are cherubim angels before God. I think that's probably right. And notice what they do. They fall down and worship God who does what? Sits on the throne. I think that's important to note whenever we are going through trials or whatever sort of pains we find ourselves in is that God is sitting on his throne. Do you believe that? And you would say, amen. I go to Believer's Chapel. Of course I believe that. Uh, you may believe that theoretically, but do you believe that in actuality in your lives, day in and day out, that there is no sin or trial that, can, that comes in life that can overrule God's sovereignty? And yet, to be honest, some hate this concept of God's sovereignty for various reasons. But as Spurgeon would say, the very thing that you complain of in God, if you don't like his sovereignty, is the very thing that you love in yourselves. Every man likes to feel like he has a right to do with his own as he pleases. We like to be our own little sovereigns. Oh, for a spirit that bows always before the sovereignty of God. Right? We like, we, I like to be sovereign of my own life. See, that's the problem, is sovereignty of God trumps you every time. But you know what? He does all things for our good. He does everything for his glory. We can trust him even though we cannot see or understand his ways. So he says, say, saying to him, Amen, hallelujah. As a kid, I often wondered when I would hear people at the end of their prayers, I may be the only one who does this, but they would say amen, and some people would say amen. And I would always go, which one is right? Which one is it? Well, actually, they're both wrong. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's amen. Um, so it's just a variation. Don't change that up. There's no reason to. You're English or at least you speak English, so go with amen or amen. But literally, it's, a, it's, it's another uh, transliteration. It means so be it. It is true. So when Jesus says in John 10, 7, truly, truly, I am the door to the sheep, what is he saying? Amen, amen. So when you amen something, you're saying full agreement. That is true. Right? So we don't know what language we'll speak when we get to heaven, but if it's Hebrew, you'll know two words at least. Amen and hallelujah. Verse 5 and 6. And a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, the small and the great. 
Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, <clears throat> and like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. So he hears a voice, John hears a voice from the throne. Is it God's voice? We don't know. It may have been the voice of one of the creatures or the 24 elders. And what are they calling out for? Give praise. It's a command. Give praise to our God, all you his bondservants, you who fear him small and great. And I think I love that because what we see in heaven is that small or great, we are all bondservants. That's our job. Uh, we serve the king. We are sons and daughters of the king. But no one gets this hierarchy uh, so much. It's not like we're waiting in line trying to get an autograph from the Apostle Paul. We're bond servants. And Paul actually himself would tell you, I'm a bond servant. What are you doing? That's all we are. Uh, and he hears, he hears a voice of a great multitude. And they're saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. What's interesting in the English, that's a present tense, but in Greek, it's not present tense. It's actually past tense. Uh, we probably could define it as he begins to reign, but really it's written in the prophetic perfect. And not to throw out too many terms here, but the, word, the prophetic perfect is a past tense used to confirm its certainty. You're very familiar with it, if you're honest. Because if you go to Romans 8, there's, there's prophetic perfects there, right? All whom he called, these he justified. All whom he justified, these he also, what? Glorified. I look in the mirror and I know I'm not glorified. And yet it's in the past tense. It's so certain that God can say, you are glorified. Right? I know we wait for it, and yet it's also such a true matter that is written in the prophetic perfect. So our Lord, our God, reigns. So the question we also have to ask ourselves, isn't God always reigning? Isn't he always reigning? I mean, which one is it? Um, well, I would say, yes, he's always reigning in the sense that everything that occurs in your life is under the reign of God, as he providentially works out every purpose of your life and according to his plan laid down from eternity. Isn't that what Philippians 1, 6 says? That he will work out that which concerns you to the very end? But then you also have to ask yourself, wait a second, how does Jesus tell us to pray? Thy kingdom come. Why would he have us pray that if his, if his kingdom had not come yet? And that's the point. His kingdom is always in the heavenlies. He always reigns. And yet, for the first time, heaven is coming to the earth. We've been praying for it for 2,000 years. By the way, I'll confront you on this. If you find in your prayer that you never ask for his kingdom to come, are you praying the way Jesus told you to pray? Because that's what he said. We should pray. So here we have, in verse 7 and following, we'll have the marriage of the Lamb. And one of the speakers a while back explained the three different parts to the ancient Jewish wedding. So I won't belabor all of that. And yet I want to bring up some points. I loved what he had to say about it. And really we'll find out that this really does parallel Christ's marriage to the church. The first act in the Jewish wedding would be betrothal. It'd be a contract which occurred between fathers of two families. Many kids would know from the time that they were young who their future spouse would be. Uh, it was binding, by and large. It at a certain point, they're thought of as legally married. We see this with Joseph and Mary, and yet not yet consummated. So the idea is that God the Father chose a bride for his son before time began. She wasn't a pretty bride. She was ugly, wicked. And yet the Father would know that these people I will set apart for myself. I will make them beautiful through the washing of the word, through the spirit. So in John 6, 36, or rather 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. What do we say at a wedding to this day? Who gives this woman to be married to this man? And what does Jesus say? All that the Father gives me. All the ones that he has chosen for my bride will come to me. Secondly, we have the bride price. As the daughter is given to the groom, the groom had to pay a bride price. He had to. It had to be in the form of money, or if he was a very poor man, it could be in the way of services. You see this in the Old Testament, do you not? Uh, Saul wants David to marry his daughter, not because he loves David, because he wants David to be killed. 
And David said, I don't have the money. I, I can't afford to marry the king's daughter. And so Saul says, I'll make you a deal. Go out and kill 100 Philistines, and, uh, and that'll work as the bride price, hoping the Philistines would kill him. And yet God uh, grants that David kills 200. So that's the price. What price does Jesus pay as the son, as the groom? He pays with his own life, does he not? John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's the bride price, and I will pay it. And so what do we have after that? You would have, you would have an interval period somewhere between the betrothal and the presentation of the bride. And at that time, the son or the groom would go to his father's house and he would add a room, right? We see this John 14, 2, in my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you so, for I'm going there to prepare a place for you. As our speaker mentioned a while back, that the son uh, could not receive the okay to go pick up his bride until the father has checked the room to make sure the room was sufficient for his future daughter-in-law. So that's the interval period. Finally, you would have the presentation. As the young adults, the young uh, man and woman, reach a suitable age, the groom's father presents the contract to the bride's father. The son gets dressed up and takes his friends out and goes singing on the way to the bride's house. Now, keep in mind, as you know, the bride would never know when her groom would show up. Could be a day, could be at night, as Jesus would say. It was always a surprise. You remember after Jesus rises from the dead in Acts chapter 1, the disciples come to him and say, hey, tell us when the kingdom's coming. It's a picture of when is the marriage going to take place. And what does Jesus say? It is not for you, it says in Acts 1-7, to know the times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. It's not for you to know. Question. Do you think the bride would do things differently if she knew when exactly the groom was coming? Oh, sure she would. Sure she would. She may not sleep. At the particular time, if she knew this were coming in the evening, this date, oh my goodness, Yes. She'd be all dolled up, ready to go, and yet she doesn't know. And so the idea is that she needs to always be ready. And so the question thus for the church, would we do things differently if we knew when the groom was coming? Yes. And how sad that is on our part that we should always be ready, always ready for his return, because we never know when. So finally, the day arrives where the groom comes. He takes her and the wedding party to his father's house where she would be presented. It's interesting the way they did it in the ancient Jewish weddings. Uh, it says here, one of the commentators, the bride's hand is placed into the hand of the father of the groom who would then put her hand into the hand of his son. Right? Ephesians 5.27, it says that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So the presentation of the bride, the church, is yet to come. So what is the best part as we go through this historical dialogue? What's the best part of the presentation? Well, I don't know about you, but the best part of weddings for me is the, is the reception, the celebration, uh, the wedding feast. And that's what you have here. Revelation 21, 2, he says, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. That's interesting. Even the place that we will one day reside, it, as John describes it, he, he, he looks and he goes, it's like a bride prepared for her husband. It's a total picture, y'all, of Christ and the church, the groom and the bride. So next time you go to a wedding, you need to remember this. It's a foretaste of what is to come. So, uh, at the old days, what they would do is they would have a few days of celebration. Sometimes if you're really rich, you'd have weeks of celebration. How long will our celebration be with the Father, with the Son, and the Spirit? We don't really know. It, it may be the thousand-year reign of Christ. Um, last question before we go right back into the text. Are we married to Christ yet, according to this analogy? Well, in some sense, yes. In the mind of God, of course, the prophetic perfect is used in Romans 8. We're justified, of course. We are justified in His sight. But are we glorified? No, we're not. 
And so the actual wedding, in some sense, has yet to occur. And yet in biblical times, as I said, the betrothed woman is always called the wife. And so we are the wife. We are the bride of Christ. Verse 7 and 8. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. First off, the word bride is really translated wife. I'm not certain many of you all have that in your translations, but it's, it's pretty clear here. The wife has made herself ready. In the Old Testament, who was God's wife? It's Israel, right? And as we know in Romans 11 and Zechariah 14, there still is a future for Israel. I firmly believe that. And yet now we find that the bride of Christ is, is larger. The wife is made up of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And she's made herself ready. Now that may give you pause made herself ready. Is that a contradiction in grace? I mean, Romans 3 makes it very clear, no one righteous, no, not one, no one seeks after God. Is this a contradiction? She made herself ready? Well, like what Dr. Johnson said, verse 8, it says, it was given to her. In other words, she made herself ready because it was given to her by God to do just what she did. This is true in Scripture, is it not? Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And then Philippians 1, or rather Philippians 2.12 and 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Aren't you glad it doesn't stop there? <laughs> for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So as fallen humans... Uh, now redeemed, we have a tendency to drive on one side of the road or the other. Uh, so some doctrines would say, uh, it is all of God. Our job is to basically do nothing, and God will just work out these things in us. Whereas another doctrine would say, no, it's up to you to do all of these things, and it's all on you. And yet, folks, you have to keep both of these plates spinning in midair. It's not either or, it's both and. We work as he works in us. It's, it's both and. It's both. Because uh, if it's not both, you fall into hyper-Calvinism on one side or you fall into rank Arminianism on the other. So it's both. Um, notice this, continuing on. What are, the, what are we clothed in? And by this way, at this point I say we, because y'all, this is us. We are clothed in linen, bright and clean. These are the righteous acts of the saints. Is this symbolic or literal? I take it as both. Um, I take it one day when we are uh, standing with him, we will look down and go, oh, I really am in this linen. This is amazing. Wow, the word of God really is true. Um, well, what is this? Uh, Dan had said, I'll quote him, it's not so much justification signified in the purity of, our, of her garments, though that is foundational to what is described here. These are the acts, the life, the conduct of the justified person characterized by obedience, faithfulness, and that's how we prepare ourselves for the Lord's coming. So you're familiar with the phrase, you can't take it with you, right? And yet as believers, we can send it ahead. We see this when Jesus says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. We're supposed to do this. Tommy Nelson did a uh, sermon on this, and I thought it was pretty good. He, he drew out the many places in the New Testament that talks about uh, the righteous acts of the saints, that by God's grace alone, we can send on ahead. Uh, he'll, he quotes these here. Uh, Matthew, uh, Matthew 6, three parables of Christ, the 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 9, 2 Corinthians 5, Romans 14, Ephesians 6, Philippians 4, 2 John 8. There's probably others, but those are the ones that he listed. I'll just quote these for you. Romans uh, 14. But before I do, let me ask you a quick question. Will we be judged one day? Uh, context. What do you mean by that? Well, will we be judged for sin? No. That's already judged at the cross. Christ took on that. And yet one day, will we be judged? Yes. Romans 14, 12. So then each of us will give account of himself to God. 
Listen to all these uh, verses here as we go through them. 2 Corinthians 5.10, We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, according rather good, rather good or bad. So we're not paying for our sins. There's no purgatory. The sins have been paid for the cross, but Christ will open the books and take a look at our lives. Um, how will he judge, though? Because we all do deeds, right? It seems that we're judged mostly regarding our motivations. Um, so the way it works is that were your good deeds done for God's glory, which is described as, as uh, gold and silver and precious stones, or were they done for you? and for the benefit of, of being seen by others. And that seems to be the wood, hay, and stubble. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.13 talks about that. Each man's work will become evident, for the day will work, rather will show it, uh, it because it is to be revealed with fire, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So you're justified before Christ, you are righteous before Christ, and yet at the same time God has these things, these good deeds set before you, and he wants you to walk in them. Uh, Ephesians 6, 8, whatever good thing each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. Uh, Philippians 4, 17, if you remember the Philippians supported Paul, they were one of the few churches that did. And notice what he says about their gifts of money. He says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit for which increases to your account. Philippians. The money is great, but that's not really the issue. The fact of the matter is that you sent it on to me. And one day uh, that will be uh, noted. It's already noted in the heavenlies, but one day you'll see the results of that in heaven. 2 John 8, watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Once again, picture of future reward. And finally, 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, I discipline my body and make it my slave, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. Now, if you think that Paul is referring to a disqualification regarding his salvation, the, uh, his justification, I don't think so. I think he's referring to disqualified regarding reward. Um, the, the, the point of the matter of all this is saying that, y'all, we live for the kingdom. We live for the next life. Uh, we do the works that God has given us to do. And God in His kindness rewards us for the work that the Spirit does within us. So I often say it's, it's not so much uh, it's what God does in you, but many times what God does in spite of you in this life. Verse 9 and 10, Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell at His feet to worship Him. But He said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You know, Jesus speaks about this future marriage supper of the Lamb. In Matthew 8, 11, he looks at his disciples and he says, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west. I'm going to stop there. With the west? Yeah, that's us, <laughs> along with everything that was west of Israel at that time period. It says, and they will dine at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus tells us about this. Uh, he'll even say in Matthew 26, 29, the reason why Jesus does not drink wine right now. He'll say, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. He's looking forward to that, as we should look forward to that. So in verse 9, he says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Note, we didn't invite ourselves, right? And really the picture here is not just a simple invitation. It's more of the effectual calling of Romans 8.30. These whom he predestined, these he also called. Those whom he called, these he also justified. So everyone he Predestined, he called. Everyone he called, he justified. Everyone he justified, he glorified. That's, that's the point. There's no mishaps. There's no, oops, oh, I forgot. I missed that person. No, not at all. 
And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And note what John does next. John falls at his feet to worship him. If, if people were to ask me, why do I think the Bible is inspired? I would give them many reasons, and I would give them many examples, and here's one of them. If I were John, I would not write that down. I'm not going to write down how I fell down and worshipped an angel in heaven? Are you kidding? That's so embarrassing. Um, what happened here? Well, is John so amazed at what he's seeing, or is he falling into false doctrine? To worship angels is, is terrible. So why is he doing this? Well, I think you see somewhat a picture of this in Acts 10, 25, and 26. Cornelius calls for Peter. He knows that Peter is an apostle. He's so excited to hear the good news. And what happens? When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up saying, stand up, I too am just a man. The angel here is even stronger with John. He says, don't do that. In the Greek, it's much more along the lines of this. See to it. You stop that. Never be doing that. Right? You know, it's interesting. John the Apostle falls before an angel in heaven and worships. It's an old Rich Mullins uh, quote. He said, we are not as strong as we think we are. If John falls before an angel in heaven and worships, how much more likely are we to do the same stupid thing here on this earth? Right? Jesus, uh, rather, uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3, I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, beware. We are far too easily enamored with the messenger. Far too easily. Be careful. If you start listening to somebody on the radio or on TV and another believer comes in and says, you know, you may want to watch out for that. You need to listen to what they're saying. You need to be careful. It happens way too easily, especially it seems in evangelical Christianity today. We are far too enamored with our different podcasts and different speakers. Um, it's a sad state of affairs when we're too drawn to the messenger instead of the message. He says, I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So the angel directs him, hey, worship the Lord. Much in the same way that Peter directs Cornelius. And much in the same way that we should direct others. Hey, worship the Lord. And he ends with this. He says, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You can understand this in one of two ways. And it's a bit hard to decide, so I'll give them both to you. Number one, he's saying the spirit of prophecy. Now, first off, the prophecy could be re regarding revelation, or it really could be referring to the whole canon of Scripture. Old Testament and New Testament were given to us by prophecy, if you will. And what, what he's saying is that the spirit of prophecy should always point us to Jesus. If you study revelation and intently, and you're so enamored with who the Antichrist will be, or when Jesus exactly will come back, you're missing the point of prophecy. It's to point to Jesus. It's supposed to point to the Lord of, of heaven and earth. And this is the one you've got to keep going after. A second option interpretation is the true source of revelation comes from Jesus. And this may be right. The angel is, is basically looking down at John as he falls before him. And he says, don't ever be doing that. Uh, really, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The point of it is, I'm not giving you this prophecy, John, because I came up with it. This coming straight from Jesus. All right? So don't worship him. Uh, rather, don't worship me. Worship God. In conclusion, can I tell you the best romance of all time? So many people are, uh, some are more romantic than others. Normally hear uh, that... Uh, Women are saying, I wish my husband was more romantic. That tends to be common rather than the other way around. Men have their own gifts, perhaps. Uh, and yet, let me give you the best romance of all time, can I? All three persons of the Trinity work together in eternity past to get a bride for the Son. You see them all involved in it. God the Father picks and betroths a wicked people before the world to marry the son. 
Throughout the Old Testament, a wedding was being announced. The groom is coming. The groom is coming. Also called the Messiah. Not the same uh, verbiage, not not a synonym, but he's coming, and he's coming to the earth. At the right time, God the Son was sent to the earth. He lived the perfect life we could never live. And for the joy set before him, he laid down his life to purchase his bride from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. And then he rose from the dead as positive proof that this one is the only way to the Father's house. The only way. And then finally, during this interval period, what do we have? We have God the Spirit, who's raising from the dead all the chosen ones of God, drawing each of us to the beauty of the Son, wooing us, washing us then with the Word. And you know, not one is lost. You know what's fascinating about this scenario? He even uses you and me in the process of drawing those to the Son of God. You see, the Spirit is using you even today. He's calling you to do this, to make disciples of all nations, and so complete the body and bride of Christ. So if you've never met this groom before, maybe you don't know exactly what I'm referring to, but the groom is Jesus Christ. My encouragement is come to him today. Turn from your wicked ways, Or maybe even turn from your good deeds, which really are nothing more than filthy rags. We will never cover you like the bright linen of heaven. And worship King Jesus. Or as the Spirit puts it in Psalm 2, kiss the Son in homage. Kiss Him, lest He be angry and ye perish from the way when His wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in Him. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for this passage. Lord, you are so kind to give it to us. You didn't have to. In your sweet providence, you would have this written. You would even give us an embarrassing episode of John to realize how prone we ourselves are to wonder. And I pray for anybody in here who does not yet know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that you would just grant them repentance and faith. They would come to believe in the Son of God and that they would embrace him as the groom, the one they've always looked for but never knew. Father, in advance, we thank you for this day, and we praise you for your name. We pray that you would help all of us, that here today, that we would walk in the good deeds you have yet for us to do. Not because we have to gain anything. We're on the team. We have nothing to prove. And yet, simply for the joy and the banner and the worship of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray it. Amen.